Hello, health champions. Today, I want to talk about the top 10 foods to unclog your arteries. But more importantly, I want to talk about a few mechanisms because without the bigger picture, lists like this can be extremely misleading. Traditionally, we've heard that there are certain foods that are clogging up arteries, and they're always the same list. The cream, the butter, the eggs, the high-fat cheese and the meat, the saturated fat, the dietary cholesterol, and we're told that this stuff ends up in your arteries, and therefore you should avoid this. But is it really that way it works? Well, the true cause of cardiovascular disease, and there is little dispute, there is little doubt or controversy about this today. The real cause is inflammation and insulin. And when we look at these foods, what we find is that there is no association. When we compare inflammation to these foods, these foods do not cause inflammation and therefore they cannot be the cause of cardiovascular disease. So we have to get past that way of thinking. And then we come across lists and videos like this where we hear about foods that are unclogging. And these could be things like garlic and turmeric, pomegranate, sesame and flax, walnuts, beetroot, leafy greens. And we're told that these are foods that will unclog your arteries. We're told that the things on this list are superfoods, that they have some magical, miracle properties that will just take care of everything for you. And I'm not saying that these foods are bad. They're excellent foods and you should eat them, but you should not think of them as miracles because that puts us into the allopathic mindset. And what does that mean? The allopathic mindset is what has plagued us for the last 50 years or so, where we think that the symptom is this thing that randomly attacks us and that we need to treat with a pill. So now we get a pill or a medication or we get a superfood and we think that treating the symptom with that superfood is the way to go. But we forget that the symptom is a result of something that wasn't working. And we forget to fix the thing that wasn't working. Instead, we just cover it up, we treat something temporarily without getting to the root cause. So I want you to listen very carefully to this so you don't miss this point that, yes, we're gonna start implementing these 10 foods, but the most important thing about those foods is what you do before. So there are three steps to this. And before you ever get there, you want to stop putting in the bad stuff because there is no superfood that can undo the bad things that you put in. If you keep putting in the things that create the problem, there's nothing you can add to that to undo it. So we have to stop the bad. Then number two is we add some good. And these are just good solid foods. And then we start thinking, superfoods, medicinal properties, herbs, and things like that, right? Three steps. First, we have to stop putting in the thing that causes the problem. And those are things that cause inflammation, oxidative stress, and damaged LDL. Not LDL cholesterol by itself, because that is a good thing, but when that LDL gets damaged by inflammation and oxidative stress, now we have a problem. And the things that cause inflammation and oxidative stress are sugar, grain, vegetable oils, processed foods, toxins, and stress. And that's basically what most of the videos on this channel are about. So just go find those and learn more about all of these different things in more detail. So again, step one is to remove the junk. Stop putting in the things that cause the problem. So now we can get to step two, which is to add food. And this is any form of real food, animal or plant. Well, we want both. They have different properties. Animal products are neutral to inflammation. They provide building blocks. They provide what I call genuine replacement parts. That's what your body needs to build new tissues. But plants are also good food. They don't provide so many 
genuine replacement parts, but they have other things in them. They have other nutrients, they have phytonutrients, they have fiber, and also a class of chemicals called polyphenols that have been shown to reduce inflammation. And then we have essential fats. Essential means you cannot live without it. So that's kind of important. And that's part of the body's ability to regulate inflammation. So we have something called ALA, alpha-linolenic acid. And this is, by classification, the essential fatty acid that we need, the omega-3. However, what the body is really looking for is the next step, which is called EPA and DHA, which you can find in fish oil. Now, ALA is classified as essential because the body can turn ALA into EPA and DHA, and therefore EPA and DHA are not classified as essential, even though they are the end product that your body is actually looking for. Now, here's the problem, that the conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA is very poor. And the poorer your health is, the poorer your metabolic health is, the less you're gonna convert. So the really healthy people, they can probably get away with just taking the ALA, which you get from things like flax. But if you can't convert, if you have some metabolic issues, now you do need to add that EPA, DHA, which you get from fish. And there's also a lot of talk about the balance between omega-3s and omega-6s. And we want to understand that both omega-3 and 6 are necessary, but one tends to help the body regulate more anti-inflammatory and one is a little pro-inflammatory. We need both, but we need them in balance. We need about a 1 to 1 or a 1 to 2 or maybe 1 to 3 ratio. But with a modern diet and with lots of grain and seed oils and grain-fed beef, etc., we often find that the omega-6 is dominating 20 to 1, and now that's very strongly pro-inflammatory. Food number one is fatty fish, because here we have an animal protein that gives us good building blocks, but it also has lots of these essential fats. We're getting the EPA, DHA in high doses. Salmon, sardines, and mackerel are excellent sources. Those are some of the fish with less mercury and toxins, but very high levels of omega-3s. And you also wanna look for wild-caught fish because if it's wild, then it ate whatever was available in nature, which was the appropriate diet for that fish. But if it's farm-raised, now they're gonna feed it hormones and colorings and whatever garbage makes that fish grow as fast as possible and give it properties for market, not for health. Number two is any sort of animal product that was raised on land, but was raised healthily, raised in a natural way. So if the meat, if the cows ate grass, then it's healthy. If the butter came from grass-fed cows, if the dairy came from grass-fed cows, then it's good for the most part. So I put a little question mark on dairy though, because the more we process the milk and the dairy, the harder it is for us humans to digest it. So a lot of people do have sensitivities and you wanna be a little careful with different forms of dairy. So butter is great and fermented dairy is also really good for the vast majority of people. Poultry is also good if it was raised under good conditions. The chickens, ran around having a normal chicken life under the blue sky, eating grass and bugs called pastured, then that poultry is healthy and so are their eggs. And this is the biggest obstacle most people have to overcome because these are great food, but we've been scared that, well, these foods are high in saturated fat, they clog arteries, they're high in cholesterol, they clog arteries. But the question we have to ask is, are these foods inflammatory? And the answer is no. These fats, the saturated fats, are very, very stable. They don't interact. They don't react much with oxygen. They're neutral, and that's why they're good foods, 
because they don't provoke inflammation. As a matter of fact, a lot of people use these foods to reduce inflammation. If you go on a clean diet, like a Whole30 or a paleo autoimmune diet, then these are typically foods that you can all include. Number three, nuts and seeds. We have flax, chia, hemp, and we have walnuts and peely. And these are the nuts and seeds that are the highest in ALA, alpha-linolenic acid. That again, the body can convert that into EPA, DHA, which we get from fish, but the conversion is very poor. But it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to get a good amount of this still if you can get it from a clean source. You don't want to get rancid and old seeds or oil, but as long as it's fresh, it's still good food. And if you eat more of this, it means you probably eat less of something else that would be harmful. And another thing you find in the seeds, the flax, chia, and hemp are very, very high levels of soluble fiber. So they're gonna help your gut motility and your microbiome environment as well. And peely nuts are kind of rare in the Western world, in the US, but they're very common in the Philippines. So if you haven't heard of them, that's why. Number four, leafy greens provides a good foundation for everything. It's very low carb, it's very high nutrient, very high fiber. Uh, romaine, arugula, green leaf lettuce, kale, chard, and spinach are all great sources. Now, some people don't do so well with oxalates or oxalic acid, so you might want to limit the spinach a little bit or cook it thoroughly before eating it. Number five are other vegetables. So other than the leafy greens, we have cruciferous vegetables that can be other forms. They contain glucosinolates and cruciferous vegetables have been shown to reduce inflammation and help detox and cleanse the liver. And the liver, of course, is like the central hub of metabolic disease. We get the fatty liver, we get the insulin resistance, we get the metabolic syndrome and the cardiovascular health. So anything we can do to help the liver is gonna be great for avoiding heart disease. And examples of cruciferous vegetables are broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, arugula, Brussels sprouts, kale, radishes, and rutabaga. So there's a long list of different things and they seem like they have a wide range of properties, but what they have in common is that the flower of the plant forms a four leaf cross. That's where the word cruciferous comes from. And in addition to that, we have other non-starchy vegetables that are great. Things like bell pepper, avocado, celery, asparagus, artichoke, and citrus, of course, is not a vegetable, but it's something else that's good to add because you don't use so much of it. So you just get a little bit of sugar and it has lots of antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. A couple of more good things to add are cucumber and eggplant. Number six is polyphenols. So phenol, that's a phenolic ring. That's this six carbon ring that occurs in many different places, in many different foods, hundreds of different foods. And poly means it has more than one of these rings per molecule. And now we have a class of chemicals called polyphenols that have been shown to reduce inflammation. So it is a good idea to include foods with a lot of polyphenols, but which ones do we pick? Extra virgin olive oil has a lot, flax has a lot, pecans, oregano, cloves, cocoa are all good sources of this. And if we look at other lists, very often we'll see things like dates and grapes, pomegranate, wheat, rye, soybean products, red wine. And here's the problem, that while these foods have polyphenols, who are we talking about? We're talking about the people who are trying to avoid or reverse heart disease. And these people have a metabolic problem. They are insulin resistant, they have poor metabolic health. And the worst thing that they can do, even if they get some benefit from the polyphenols, the worst thing they can do is to add a bunch of sugar because that's what created the problem in the first place. So yes, look for some foods that have polyphenols, but 
don't add something to undo the benefit of the polyphenols. So dates, for example, are almost pure sugar. And a lot of these, like pomegranates, have been pronounced as a superfood, but the sugar content is also really high. So if you're already metabolically healthy, then you can have some of these. But if you're trying to reverse heart disease, then you're not metabolically healthy and then these are not a good idea. And now that we've done the groundwork, we stopped putting in the bad that caused the problem. We've put in some good to help the body make building blocks and energy and provide a good foundation. Now we're ready for the medicinal thinking, if you will. So herbal compounds can be very beneficial. Things like curcumin and resveratrol and pine bark extract those have anti-inflammatory properties. And I would say that you can get them fresh or as a supplement, but if you can find them fresh, then do that as a foundation again, because whatever nature made is gonna have more of the components with it. So turmeric, for example, comes as a root, but you can also buy it as a powder. Number eight is fish oil as a supplement. And I do believe that unless you eat fish every single day, most people would benefit from taking a supplement. So most fish oil supplements gonna have EPA and DHA in a certain ratio, usually about three to two, meaning a little bit more of the EPA. So EPA stands for Icosapentaenoic Acid. And don't worry about the name. It supports vascular health. So the anti-inflammatory benefits are probably mostly from the EPA. The DHA, however, can be even more important in a different way because DHA stands for docosahexaenoic acid. It's a little bit longer of a molecule, but this is your brain building supplement most of the fatty acids, most of the omega-3s in your cell membranes and in your body and in your brain are made up of DHA. So it's a hugely important building block of nervous tissue. And therefore, if you're missing this, oftentimes your brain isn't quite working the way it's supposed to. And we can have things like stress and anxiety and focus and depression because the frontal lobe is too weak. So what we find is with DHA, people often find relief with all of these as well as a better functioning frontal lobe. And now if you have more DHA and less stress, then that's also gonna start affecting inflammation. So they work in conjunction, but I would say if you're sort of just looking for a general, then you go with something that has about a three to two. But if you're looking to specifically address some anxiety and some brain function, then you wanna look for something that's higher in DHA. Number nine is B vitamins. And they're super important in the mitochondria where we make energy. They act as catalysts for moving the process of energy production forward. There's also something called homocysteine. And this is something that's very pro-inflammatory. It is very strongly correlated to heart disease. And you can measure this pretty simply on a blood test. And the normal range is zero to 15, but you really wanna keep it about half of that. Like zero to seven is a much better level and less is better. So this is a byproduct. It's an intermediate that we can turn in, in a second step, we can turn it into something harmless if we have enough B vitamins. And we need B12, B6, and folic acid. And the people that have trouble with this conversion are people who have a genetic defect called the MTHFR. So you have one of these genes from each of your parents and you could have a mutation in one or both. And about 30 to 40% of the people in the US have a mutation in one of these. And then that means that you have a buildup of this or potentially have a buildup of this homocysteine and you're more prone to heart disease. And you can ask for this on your blood test. It's not that difficult to test. 
And if you can't remember it, then there's a little acronym there that I can't say out loud in this video, but you get the idea. But even though this is a serious problem, there's a relatively simple fix. And it's to take some B vitamins and to make sure that they're methylated because if they contain a methyl group, a methyl donor, then that helps the conversion of this homocysteine into this harmless compound. And this is what nutritional yeast looks like. It's a whole food, it's a great source of a full spectrum B vitamins to provide a foundation for your B vitamins. And number 10 are enzymes. Enzymes break things down in the body. They can be in your digestive tract and break down food, but they can also be systemic enzymes and break down things in your body. And there's a supplement form. We can take something called natokinase or lumbrokinase that are especially important for breaking down things we don't want related to cardiovascular disease. So these are called fibrinolytic. So when we make blood clots in the body, there's something called fibrin. And these enzymes help break down excessive amounts of that. And there are two times that can be super important. One is if you have cardiovascular disease and you wanna avoid blood clots. The other is with COVID-19 infections because a huge problem with COVID-19, both during the acute phases and in many, many months after is that there are blood clots. We have too high blood viscosity as a result of the infection. And then there's a really good chance that natokinase and lumbrokinase can help break down those blood clots and improve the blood viscosity again. And there's also some evidence that the fibrin that makes up these blood clots are also linked to the plaque. So this would be one way that we can actually reverse plaque. Of course, if we first have done steps one, two, and three that we talked about. And then there are other enzymes as well, serapeptase that is proteolytic that can break down other aspects of protein besides just clots. A lot of people have asked me what kind of products I use and what I use for my patients in the office. And I do use a lot of these products for the last three steps that we've talked about. So I'll put some links down below where you can order at a discount if you're interested. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna love that one. And if you truly wanna master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.